This is Barry Zalma presenting a program of true crime stories about insurance fraud, explaining why insurance fraud costs everyone. These stories show how insurance fraud succeeds, how it fails, how insurers succeed in defeating insurance fraud, and how they fail. The stories are fiction, or at least they are fictionalized true stories from my 54 years in the insurance business as both a claims adjuster, a lawyer, and a coverage lawyer. Chapter 1. The Great Jewel Theft The insured purchased for the first time in his life a policy of personal articles floater, or PAF, insurance scheduling $125,000 worth of ladies' jewelry. When he first acquired the insurance, he advised the insurer that the jewelry was always kept in a Class E safe, one that requires at least 30 minutes to drill out the lock. And that, that safe was located at his residence. He also told the insurer that he was employed full-time as the owner of a gasoline service station and that he had never been canceled or suffered a previous loss. One month after the policy was issued, just before the first installment of the premium finance contract was due, the insured reported to his insurer that two armed robbers came to his door at midnight while his wife and child were fortuitously away helping a neighbor fill out immigration and naturalization forms and forced him at gunpoint to open the safe. They removed only the jewels, struck him on the head with the weapon, and tied him up like a mummy with fifty-six feet of rope. They just happened to have had the foresight to bring with them. The insurer, probably concerned about the accuracy of the report, started the thorough investigation required by state statute. The investigation produced evidence that the insured claimed he had owned the jewelry for over 20 years. He advised his insurer's investigator that the insured received the jewelry as a gift from his grandmother when he immigrated to the United States. The insured had immigrated to the United States from what was then known as Soviet Armenia with his entire family of six. His jewels had been stored in the bedroom closet of his apartment without incident for the full twenty years. Neither the insured's father nor any of his relatives knew about the gift because it was not their business to know. The insured also, because it was not his business to, to know, did not know whether his father or his brothers had received a similar gift from his grandmother. The insured had resided in an apartment building owned by his father for many years, but just two months before buying insurance, he had moved to his new residence a larger, second-floor apartment in the same building. The investigation established that, in truth, the insured did not own a service station and was, in fact, unemployed for two years before the robbery. His father owned a service station, and the insured would sometimes, for no pay, help his father operate the station. Further, just before the policy was issued, his residence was burglarized of jewelry not scheduled on the PAF, that he advised the investigator he forgot to tell the insurer about that theft when he was filling out the application. The insured had once owned a service station. He lost his franchise when the franchisor found out he was running multiple credit card strips from customers and forging their signatures on the slips. He eventually pleaded guilty to a forgery charge and was placed on probation. 
the jeweler who appraised the jewelry stated to the insurance adjuster that he could replace it all for 50% of the appraised value. In addition, the investigation revealed that the insured had suffered multiple losses of automobiles. In, in fact, the same car was stolen three times in two years, and he earned large sums from automobile accidents. The insured and his entire extended family were always together in a car and went to the same chiropractor for treatment when an accident happened. The insured and the family used the same lawyer to represent their interest against the insurers for the parties who they claim caused the accident. The insurer, after completing its investigation, denied the claim for the loss of jewelry because the insured obtained the policy by means of misrepresentation of material fact and concealment of material fact. The insured, as was his basic experience, sued the insurer for breach of contract and breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, seeking both compensatory and punitive damages. The court was reluctant to grant the insurer's motion to strike the claim for punitive damages, although evidence was ample that the insurer had good cause to reject the claim. Discovery in the lawsuit established that the insured and his father had reported the identical diamond ring stolen one year apart and had made the mistake of having it appraised by the same jeweler. The jeweler was willing to testify to the identity of the stones. Discovery also established two warranty violations in the policy. Such facts were sufficient to establish fraud. However, when the defendant is an insurer, fraud is not that easy to establish and be accepted by a court. The litigation dragged on for four and one-half years. The insurer moved for summary judgment attaching voluminous evidence of fraud only to have the trial court refuse to grant summary judgment because the judge wanted the insured to get his day in court. The case was set for trial, and the insured plaintiff made an offer of settlement that he would release the insurer of all liability in exchange for $30,000 cash. By the time the offer was made, the insurer was faced with a potential judgment with interest of 10% per annum, building over time of at least $250,000 in compensatory damages and the possibility of excessive amounts in punitive damages if the jury disagreed with the position of the insurer. Counsel for the insurer was obligated to point out to his client that the costs in attorney's fees and expert witness fees needed to take the matter through a trial by jury would probably exceed the $30,000 demand, not to mention the cost to resolve any necessary post-trial motions and appeals. In the state, felony insurance fraud can be established by an insured who submits one false document or makes one false statement in the presentation of a claim. The insurer, as required by law, advised of the evidence it had of the fraudulent claim to the State Department of Insurance Fraud Unit, to local police, and to prosecutors. None were interested in filing a criminal case. The insured had nothing to lose, since he never owned the jewelry in the first place, and concluded that a $30,000 recovery, even after paying a contingency fee to his lawyer, was better than a judgment giving him nothing. To the insurer, the exposure was too big, and the potential gain was too small. The insurer, convinced that the insured had perpetrated a fraud, especially after he made an offer to settle for less than 15% of the amount of insurance, paid the demand because the state refused to honor its commitment 
to work to defeat insurance fraud and to prosecute all persons who could be proved to have committed the crime of insurance fraud. The insurer was pleased, in fact, to be rid of the exposure and the need to continually pay lawyers to defeat the fraudulent claim. Fraud succeeded, but the insured at least had to work to collect it. Members of the public and the insurance industry as a whole lost as a result of this decision of the insurer to make an economic settlement since the settlement was less than it would have cost to go to trial to defeat the insured suit. The same insured has presented at least four additional what are apparently fraudulent claims since he accepted the settlement. His father also collected for the theft of the identical ring, and they enjoyed the proceeds of their fraud. If insurance fraud is to be stopped, the profit must be taken out of it. Since prosecutors seem disinterested, it is necessary for the insurance industry to take the chance on a punitive damage award and to try every case where they believe fraud is being perpetrated. If they continue to take the easy and least expensive way out, the cost to the industry as a whole will multiply. Of course, insurers have shareholders who want to make a profit on their investment. Taking chances like those I propose will gain the ire of the shareholders, and that is why this jewel theft claim, although nothing was owed, was what the insurer believed to be a logical and prudent decision to pay the demand. Prosecutors must be educated that insurance fraud is a serious crime that is taking multiple billions of dollars from the insurance industry. The cost of fraud is too big to continually pass it on to the honest insurance consumer. If the prosecutors had taken note of the reports they received from the insurer, the insured would have been arrested and convicted, and the insured's lawsuit would have been immediately dismissed. Perhaps if fraud did not make insurance so expensive, the number of honest insurance customers would be larger. Now it appears to be a very small group. An insurance research group, in fact, found that more than 67% of all insurance claims in Los Angeles are fraudulent to some degree. The insured who presented the false jewelry claim is one of those 67% presenting fraudulent automobile insurance claims. Twenty years after the claim was resolved, the insured was arrested tried and convicted of being the leader of a terrorist and criminal organization called the Armenian Mafia. He is now serving a long term in federal penitentiary. He might not have gotten involved with this Armenian Mafia if he had been arrested, charged, and convicted of the insurance fraud crime. This is the first of many insurance fraud videos I will pr provide and record as the days go on so that the public will understand why and how insurance fraud costs everyone. Thank you for your attention.